I really like Osmond Sadler as a villain for two reasons. First, the absolute absurd fantastical scale of his ambitions. He wants to take over the world. And okay, that isn't that crazy. A lot of action fantasy game villains want to take over the world. It's a fairly common villain motivation. But Sadler's ambitions are way bigger than simply ruling the world. Sadler wants to use the Plaga Parasite to personally control every single individual human life on the entire planet. As in literally directly control their minds. He doesn't just want to rule the world from atop some distant ivory tower. He wants to decide what every single person thinks, believes, and does at all times, everywhere, forever. In some ways, this is even beyond godhood. Most gods leave their subjects some amount of free will. He wants to set himself up as the singular brain of a massive hive mind organism, in which all people everywhere will become part of his body extensions of himself as much a part of himself as his own arms and legs and just as easily controlled. If his plan succeeded, free will would cease to exist forever. There would be no resistance, no possibility of rebellion. Humanity as a species would change forever. And the Plaga Parasite doesn't only infect people. Files in the game mention that the Parasite can infect animals, mammals, birds, and fish. There's a possible future here where Osmond Sadler doesn't just control all human life, but literally all life on the planet, where every single mammal, bird, and fish on the planet become a part of his hive mind super organism. Like I said before, the scale of his ambitions is insane. Sadler is among the most ambitious villains I've ever encountered anywhere, and that makes him pretty exciting. The second reason I really like Osmond Sadler is that, for all his insanity, for all his megalomania, his sadism, his greed, his casual disregard for the value of life, his unrelenting quest for total control. I do think he actually believes in the religion he teaches. He really does believe in the blessings and gifts of his parasitic god, and he wants to share those cursed blessings and gifts with the entire world. There's an element of twisted benevolence within his character. From his dialogue, it seems like he really believes that being infected by the Plaga Parasite is a good thing, that people should want this, that people really will be better off in this new world of his. He calls it a gift, and I don't think that's just rhetoric. I think he really views this infection as a gift. Just look at what kind of power it has granted him. Why shouldn't everyone else want it too? In the final boss fight, he seems genuinely kind of offended that Leon rejects the parasite. He has a bit of a dude, what is your problem attitude in that final confrontation. It's these two things, the incredible scale of his ambitions and that twisted benevolence of his, that I think make Osmond Sadler a really good villain. Now, there is a discussion to be had over whether Sadler is truly in control of any of his actions, or if he himself is being controlled by the Plaga Hivemind, but I'll discuss that in more detail as we reach the relevant story beats. What I want to do now is go through the game, follow his story piece by piece, and see how the game introduces, develops, and ultimately ends the story of Osmond Sadler. In the original release of Resident Evil 4, Sadler's origins were a total mystery. We had no clue where he came from, exactly how he took control of the Los Illuminados cult, how he learned of the existence of the Plaga Parasite, how he developed these very advanced biotech research and production facilities on this barren island. However, in the remake, I think most of these gaps have been filled. We know a lot more about his story now than we did before. Osmond Sadler's story begins with the story of the Sadler family. Despite their not very Spanish-sounding name, the Sadler family is actually a very old family in the region of rural Spain where the game takes place. The Sadler family has deep roots here. The final section of the game takes place on this barren island, the location of Sadler's headquarters and the location of your final confrontation with him. On this island, you can find a couple of very old stone markers, and these stone markers tell the story of the Sadler family. You can find the first one in this cave near where Leon first makes landfall. 
It begins with the Roman numeral for 1741, which is presumably the year this marker was erected, meaning this marker is nearly 200 years old. Then it says, Expelled by the militant wicked, we find ourselves in exile. Withered is the grass, barren are the trees. We wait in expiation, this isolated island our purgatory. Yet despair not, brothers and sisters, our time shall come. Hester Sadler. These words were spoken by Hester Sadler, an ancestor of Osmond Sadler. The Sadler family has been in the region for at least three centuries, and they have been leading the Illuminatos cult for all that time. According to this marker, Hester Sadler and her followers were exiled to this island by a group of somebodies who opposed their religion. That group of somebodies was most likely the aristocratic Salazar family, whose castle you explore in the game. The Salazar family originally originally sealed away the Plaga Parasite to protect the world, at least until the current Castellan Ramon Salazar took over. The Salazar family also drove the Illuminatos cult off the mainland and onto this barren island. The Illuminatos cult worships the Plaga Parasite, believing that its infection grants holy gifts. Everyone else finds that infection to be horrific and dangerous, so it's not surprising that they'd come into conflict with the locals. The marker goes on to say that the cult waits an expiation meaning reparation or guilt. The cult has committed some sin for which they must atone. This probably refers to the loss of the Plaga Parasite to the Salazar family, their failure to prevent the sealing away of the parasite. The marker ends with a proud declaration that, despite their current dismal circumstances, the cult will rise again, a declaration fulfilled by Osmond Sadler three centuries later. We learn a lot about the Sadler family from this marker. First, that they've been in the area for a long time. Second, that they've been leading the Illuminatus cult for a long time. Third, that they've inhabited this island specifically for a long time. And fourth, that the Sadler family, along with the Illuminatus cult, has historically faced some serious persecution. And in spite of that persecution, they have survived. This is a barren island. Life would be nearly impossible here. The cult was sent here to die, and they didn't. They survived. Eventually, they thrived and even overthrew the people who had exiled them. It would be an impressive story if the Sadler family weren't a bunch of monsters trying to take over the world. The Sadlers are survivors. They have been under attack for a very long time and survived. And you can see that tenacity within Osmond himself. He's a hard guy to kill. I didn't find another of these markers until until hours later after the helicopter crash. Here it is. This one begins with the Roman numerals for 1827, which means that this one was written over 80 years after the previous marker. It says, The bones of our brethren rest in all nations. The blood of our brethren provides all food. We die only to be reborn. We live on through eternity. We reign absolute. Keenan Sadler. The previous marker was pretty straightforward, but I find this one's meaning to be much more cryptic. The key here is understanding what this means when it says brethren. Is it referring to members of the Illuminatos cult? Have the Illuminatos secretly spread across the whole world? I thought brethren might also refer to the Plaga Parasite. Has the parasite itself spread across the world already? Or perhaps by brethren it means other natural bioweapons similar to the Plaga, which are seen throughout the entire Resident Evil series. Maybe all of these different bioweapons are related somehow. I think all three of these interpretations are potentially correct, but I lean towards brethren literally referring to the Plaga parasites themselves because of that second line. The blood of our brethren provides all food seems to be saying that the Plaga Parasite provides all the sustenance its worshippers need, perhaps explaining how they survived on this barren island. The next three lines of this marker are straightforward. With Plaga, even when you are killed, you can be reborn after death, which we've definitely seen happen in the game. With Plaga, you are essentially immortal, and the Illuminatus cult plans to rule the world. Even back in the 19th century, they had grandiose ambitions. These words are attributed to Keenan Sadler, another ancestor of Osmond's. The Sadler family ruled this island in the cult that lived here for centuries. In one of the notes you find in his laboratory, Luis states that the Sadler died 
dynasty's rule here was savage and harsh, that they treated the people very poorly. The Sadler family's history is a history of tyrants, ruling through a mix of religious fervor and brute force. One thing I wondered about after finishing the game was, what would an entire world ruled by Osmond Sadler look like? What if he succeeded? Well, in the history of this island, we can see what Sadler rule looks like, and it's pretty dreary. I only found one more of these markers in the game. This one was at the center of the cult sanctuary. It begins with the Roman numerals for 1554, which means this one is about 200 years older than the first marker we found. The Sadler family has been experimenting with the Plaga Parasite for 500 years. What we are seeing in Resident Evil 4 is the culmination of five centuries of experimenting, learning, proselytizing, struggling, and scheming. The scale of the story of the Sadler family matches the ambitions of Osmond Sadler. This marker says, Deep beneath the castle grounds I have found my faith. Oh, behold the divine vestiges left upon this world. It all begins here. Adam Sadler. Adam Sadler, the oldest ancestor of the Sadler family we know of, discovered the Plaga Parasite deep below Salazar Castle. He immediately associated it with the Divine. He calls the Parasite a Divine Vestige, meaning a trace of something which no longer exists. For example, dinosaur fossils are vestiges of animals that no longer exist. Adam Sadler believed that the Plaga he found, fossilized in amber, perhaps millions of years old, were only a small remnant of something much greater that once dwelled on this planet. Adam Sadler doesn't say anything about power. He doesn't say anything about a desire to rule the world. He speaks only of the perceived divinity of the parasite. This didn't begin as a plan for world domination. Adam Sadler was a true believer, and I think Osmond Sadler is too. On this barren island, the ruthless and ambitious Sadler family worked in secret for 15 generations. They worshipped the Plaga, experimented with it, schemed, and planned. Finally, Osmond, the 15th member of the Sadler dynasty, found a way to imbue his body with the dominant strain of the parasite, which would allow him to control all the others. He manipulated the weak-minded Ramon Salazar into unsealing the Plaga beneath the castle, obtaining a near-unlimited supply of the parasite. He infected the entire region's population with the parasite, building a powerful army totally loyal to himself alone. He recruited Luis Navarro, a star researcher from the ruined Umbrella Biotech Corporation on the run from authorities to help perfect parasite injection. He lured the American Special Forces Major Jack Krauser to his side with promises of power. Together, the two concocted a plan to kidnap the American president's daughter, infect her with a special bioengineered strain of the Plaga Parasite, and then send her back to infect the American government, and from there, the world. Krauser succeeded in kidnapping the girl and bringing her back to Osmond Sadler, who did infect her. So far, everything was going according to plan. The spread of the Plaga Parasite parasite across the world would soon begin, and this is where the plot of Resident Evil 4 starts. American Special Agent Leon Kennedy is sent to Spain to track down the president's kidnapped daughter. From here, I want to watch each of Sadler's appearances in the game, see how he is introduced, how he is characterized, and how his character is developed over the course of the game. At the start of the game, you explore this village, and here you see the effects of Sadler's plans. All of these villagers have been infected by the Plaga. You can see here what kind of world he wants to create. And it's a world full of crazy, brainwashed, shambling, homicidal zombie people living among rot and filth. Frankly, it's a pretty poopy looking world. In one of his files, Luis states that a world in which everyone everywhere was infected by the parasite, where everyone is a part of this single hive mind, would be a world without war or violence, a world of peace. But we see here that peace would come at a heavy price. All people would lose free will, and most people would lose their intellect. And Lord Sadler doesn't treat his subjects very well, they live in squalor. At the end of chapter 1, Leon is infected by the Plaga. While unconscious, Leon has some sort of vision, and in this vision we finally see Sadler for the first time. This scene is the villain's introduction, so let's watch it and see how he's being portrayed. Sacrificial lamb, you will receive our most sacred body. It begins now. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is a very short scene. You don't see much of Sadler here. And that's actually an interesting part of how Sadler's character is developed in the early game. He is a largely hands-off villain. He works through his network of zombies and minions rather than taking care of business on his own. For the first several hours of the game, you will see very little of him. In this way, he is a classic action video game villain. You have to fight your way through all of his henchmen before you can reach him. It's only after all of his subordinates have failed that he takes to the battlefield himself. Of course, we eventually discover that, through the hive mind, all of these zombies and minions are essentially extensions of himself. He may seem like a distant, hands-off villain, but really, everyone here is Sadler. Everyone here shares his will. The writers are also building up a lot of mystery around his character here. He is shrouded in shadows, wearing dark robes. You see very little of him. You don't know anything about his motivations yet. You don't know his name. At this point, you wouldn't even know for sure that he's the main villain of the game. All you know about him is two lines of rambling, religious-sounding talk. Talk of sacrificial lambs and sacred bodies. From here, Sandler disappears from the game for a couple hours. But even when he's absent, the game develops his character. You can find his portrait hanging in some prominent places, establishing his importance to the local people. You can find mentions of a Lord Sadler in various notes throughout the area. You can find verses from the cult's holy text. It's all pretty vague and sparse, but what the writers are doing is slowly building up his character through epistolary elements, rewarding players who care enough to explore with stringent pieces of a story they can put together themselves. Slowly, you'll come to understand that this cult is ruled by a man named Sadler, that everyone here is fanatically loyal to him, that he is imparting blessings or gifts upon the local population, and that he is very focused on Ashley, the president's daughter. You will also see more of the world that Sadler would create. It is a world of monsters, of rot, and of death. The game shows you that his is a rotten soul by showing you the rotten environment in which he rules. The writers don't need to bring the big man himself on screen to accomplish this. At the end of chapter 3, after battling Delago, Leon throws up blood, passes out, and has another vision of Sadler, and we finally see the main villain again. This vision is pretty similar to the previous one, but it includes some important additions, and it's still pretty short, so let's watch it. Sacrificial lamb, you will receive our most sacred body. It begins now. When day breaks, you too will join our covenant to share in my holy blessing forever. Once again, Sadler is hidden in shadows, his face obscured. All of Sadler's dialogue is totally filled with religious language, much of it a sort of twisted mirror of Christian symbolism. Sacrifice, lamb, sacred body, covenant, holy blessing. These are all words you might hear in a Christian church, but they mean something very different here. The writers are using familiar religious language to define what kind of cult this is. It is an organized religion. It involves a covenant with a sacred being. Worshippers will receive blessings from this being. From all the horror and misery in the game, players will already know that this sacred being and its blessings must be horrific. One other interesting thing about his dialogue is when he says, you will share in my holy blessing. Sadler so closely associates himself with his god that he believes himself to be a god too. Sadler is not just a prophet or cleric for his god. His body is literally a a vessel for his god. It lives within him. He and his god are biologically inseparable. It is impossible to say where the parasite ends and where the man begins. The next time we see a vision of Sadler is after Leon has finally found Ashley, so let's watch that too. Pursue them. <laughs> the last lambs are escaping. Deliver unto them salvation. Leon 
and Ashley have both been infected by the Plaga. They are already beginning to share in Sadler's hive mind. So when he telepathically orders the villagers to pursue them, both Leon and Ashley can hear that order spoken too. This is the first time in the game where we get confirmation that Sadler is in both constant telepathic communication with all of his followers and in direct control of their actions. His language continues to be bathed in religious terminology. He doesn't tell his followers to kill or hurt Ashley or Leon, but instead much more vaguely to deliver unto them salvation. When he calls Ashley and Leon lost lambs, I think he's being genuine. I think he really thinks like, oh, those poor kids, they haven't seen the truth yet. Let's help them out with pitchforks and hatchets. His moral compass is so warped that he really believes he's doing the right thing, when it's so obvious to any outside observer that he's the bad guy here. The next time we see Sadler is a little different. We don't see him in a vision. We don't even see him in person. Instead, we see him through Ashley, who is infected by the parasite and under his control, so let's watch it. Looks like the right place. You okay? I think so. Instead of worrying about her, worry about your own skin. Foolish little lamb. This is Sadler. This is what the Plaga hive mind looks like. There is no separation between Ashley's body and Sadler's body here. No separation between their wills. In this scene, Sadler and Ashley have a single mind, and it's not a shared mind. This is not a hive mind scenario where both Sadler and Ashley share each other's thoughts. This is a hive mind scenario where both Ashley and Sadler think Sadler's thoughts. And only his thoughts, only his will. Ashley as an individual, as a person, as a life, essentially ceases to exist. This is something else that makes Sadler a really good villain. At the most basic level, every action game villain needs to seem powerful, imposing, frightening for the story to function. And in this scene, Sadler is all of those things. Before this scene, you only ever saw his power secondhand through his followers, but now you finally see it firsthand, and he is extremely powerful. How do you fight someone who can control your mind and your body? How can you fight someone who can erase your will, your individuality, your thoughts, and replace them with his own? He doesn't even have to be nearby to accomplish this. He is miles away and still possesses this level of control over her. This is the future of the entire world as Sadler's plans succeed. Everyone, everywhere will be him. It's not a hive mind so much as it is a single mind, his mind and no other. It's another couple hours before we see our final vision of Sadler. Leon is separated from Ashley and dropped down into the depths of Salazar Castle. As he makes his way back up, he sees Sadler again. This scene mostly repeats things we've already seen, but it does include an interesting perspective reveal so we we should watch it. Pitiful little lamb. Your suffering came in just as it has from his daughter. Who has joined us in communion, and now she is of our flesh, of our blood. My faithful disciple will show her the path. Go now. Deliver to these vagrant children their salvation. As you wish. All this time, we thought we were just seeing Sadler in Leon's mind. But in reality, we've been seeing Sadler through the eyes of Krauser. This suggests some interesting things about how the hive mind's shared telepathy works. Since both Leon and Krauser are a part of the Plaga hive mind, Leon can see through Krauser's eyes. This means that not only can Sadler see through his minions' hundreds of eyes, but all of them can probably see through each other's eyes too. I find Sadler's use of the collective first person interesting here. Join us in communion, our flesh, our blood. 
I think this is Sadler speaking for both himself and the Plaga within his body along with the hive mind. I've seen theories that say Sadler is just a tool for the Plaga, that he is being controlled by the Parasite too. However, this use of the collective first person suggests to me that he and the Plaga are in some form of symbiosis. It's not the Plaga controlling him or vice versa, instead they share a collective will. A merging of their being has occurred. He and the Plaga are one being. Do you control your arms or legs? Or are your arms and legs simply a part of you? What's the difference? I think Sadler and Plaga have a similar relationship. They are the same body. It's a couple more hours before we see Sadler again, and this time in person, in the flesh, so let's watch it. Prostrate yourself. This is our holy body. Our divine providence and soon. Such profound blessing for all. Lost Plaga. Welcome, my children. I am Osman Sattler, the speaker for our Lord. Tell someone who gives a shit. Foolish lambs. Why do you deny grief? <laughs> Now, abandon your body. Obey. Obey the voice of our Lord. No! No! Stop! No! Sweet child, do not resist. <laughs> Pray forgive these wicked sinners. My faithful disciples shall deliver to you your penance. Now, child. You need not be afraid. Submit your body and release yourself from fear. I find this scene to be a little strange. This is the first time in the entire game that Leon and Sadler finally meet face to face. This is the villain of the story. This is the big bad. This is the man who could soon conquer the world. The story has been building up to this moment for hours. And yet this first meeting is kind of underwhelming. The meeting takes place in some random warehouse. There's no build up to this scene at all. He just randomly wanders in and starts monologuing. There isn't any dramatic new show of power here. We've already seen him in control of Ashley before. That's nothing new. We already knew he could do that. The scene is an interesting moment for her character's story, where she's gone from Little Miss Damsel in Distress to having a semi-successful battle of wills against the villain. I think that part of the scene is well written, but as the proper introduction of Sadler to the story, I feel like the writers bungled this one. If I were writing this story, I would not have introduced him like this. I would have written this to be much more dramatic. I would have tried to make him seem much bigger, much more exciting and intimidating. I definitely would not have had him just randomly wander on screen with no build-up at all. I will say that I love his new design in this remake. The way his flesh and the parasite are so horrifically but perfectly merged together is both really gross to look at, but also does an excellent job visually of showing his relationship to the Plaga. He is not being controlled by the parasite. You can see here that physically there is no separation between him and that parasite. I also love the way that Leon just starts shooting. Most action game protagonists have the courtesy to let a villain finish their monologue, but Leon's just like, tell someone who gives a shit, and then just shoots him right in the head. <laughs> I really love it. It's really fun. I think it's also interesting how little Sadler cares about his servants. 
Ashley shoots and kills two of them and he doesn't react at all. Those aren't people to him, they're just things. Just parts of his body to be cast off at any time, like a broken toenail. Notice their visual design. The bodies of his servants are completely covered by this white fabric. One of the obvious ways you can distinguish between two individuals is that two individuals will look different. Their bodies will look different, they will have different facial features. However, if you cover two people up with this identical white fabric, their individuality is lost. All of his servants in this scene look the same. Visually, this reflects their internal loss of individuality. These are not individuals. Their will has been overwritten by Saddlers. They have no thoughts of their own. These are extensions of the Plaga hive mind. The next time we see Saddler is in the cult's innermost sanctuary, so let's watch it. You have come, my child. What do you want? I simply wish to share this gift with as many as possible. A humble wish, don't you think? You see, we are all connected through the holy body. And now your flesh and bones, your very thoughts, are already one with us. Bullshit. Why do you reject serenity when you need only accept the sacred gift? Like she did. Suggler! <laughs> ah, yes, the time has come for this lamb to join our covenant. Oh, blessings unto him and the sweet mercy they bring. Exalt, calls, and let it be done. Leon, go. When asked for his motivation, Sadler says that all he wants is to spread the Plaga infection to as many people as possible. I've seen some people say, oh, in this remake, Sadler doesn't want power for himself at all anymore. Now his new sole motivation is spreading the Plaga, which he believes is a genuine gift which will benefit all, spreading peace and order across the world. He isn't the purely selfish, power-hungry villain he was in the original anymore. And I do think there is some truth to that. I think Sadler is a true believer in the perceived sacred power of the Plaga. I think he really does think humanity would be better off if everyone received this supposed gift. But you can't ignore that the spreading of the parasite will also increase his personal power. Every new person infected by the parasite is a new person under his control. A world where everyone has been infected is a world where he controls everyone. Even in the most generous analysis of his motivations, he isn't acting totally benevolent here. He's still the same power-mad, greedy villain from the original version of the game. His belief in the holiness of the parasite has increased in this remake story, but his desire for power has not decreased. Notice that line when he asks Leon, why do you reject serenity? This is a good example of his mix of motivations. On the one hand, I do think this is a genuine question. Many others have accepted his gift of the power of the parasite in the serenity of submission willingly. I don't think he really understands why Leon is rejecting it. On the other hand, if he can convince Leon to just submit, that obviously still increases his personal power. That would give him power over Leon. Sadler's motivations are a mix of genuine religious belief and hunger for power. Since he identifies himself with his god, since he is the literal physical vessel in which his god lives, those two motivations are intricately tied together. For him, worshipping his god is the same as increasing his own power. One final note here before we move on. Notice Sandler's attitude. He is very calm and collected. He has been calm in every scene he has appeared in so far. No matter what Leon does, no matter how many of Sandler's strongest henchmen are killed, no matter how his plans are ruined, 
he has maintained control of himself. We haven't seen any emotional outbursts from him. He even takes all those bullets from Ada's gun pretty calmly. He still doesn't really seem that upset about it. This is important because in the next scene, Sadler's final scene in the game, he will finally lose his cool. Here it is. At the start of the scene, Sadler is still calm, still in control of himself, because he believes, despite everything he's lost, that he is still ultimately in control of the situation. But when Leon escapes from his grasp, he finally realizes that he's lost control, and that's when he loses his cool too. He finally becomes angry, and that anger literally transforms his body, in a way that's pretty common in the Resident Evil series. Nearly every single villain in the series experiences a long loss of control over their emotions that coincides with a horrific physical transformation of their bodies. It is interesting the particular form that Sandler's anger takes here. He says, you have forsaken the holy body, the great gift. He isn't upset that Leon shot him in the face 20 times. He isn't upset that Leon spoiled his plans for world domination. He isn't upset that Leon killed all his henchmen. What really upsets him is that Leon keeps rejecting his gift. Sandler is trying to bestow upon Leon the greatest gift he knows, the sacred body. He could have just killed Leon way earlier in the story. Sandler chose to spare him more than once to invite him into this covenant hive mind. It's this rejection that infuriates him, that causes him to finally lose control. And then, Sandler transforms into a giant spider monster. He does have some interesting dialogue during this final battle. He tells Leon that if Leon just submits, Sadler will still bestow him with the holy body. This is actually kind of interesting. Usually, at this point in the story, a villain would be like, I'm gonna kill you no matter what, you suck, man. But even now, Sadler's primary motivation is the spread of the Plaga. If he could spare Leon's life, he would. Even now, he would rather use Leon than destroy him. That's relatively rare for an action game villain. He speaks about the incessant war and suffering in the world, promises to put an end to that suffering if he can spread his hive mind parasite, promises a paradise free of all misfortune. Sadler might really believe in these claims he's making, but we've seen the state of his followers. They don't really look like they're living in paradise. Their lives look pretty miserable. He also claims that he can hear the voices of the people Leon killed over the course of the game. Game, which suggests that even in death, someone's consciousness can live on in the Plaga hive mind in some form, which is pretty interesting. Sadler commands those voices to sing his praise, to worship him. And this, I think, reveals Sadler's true motivations. What he wants more than anything is to be worshipped. He wants to be praised. He wants to be beloved. He wants to be a god. Godhood is his true ambition. In his final form, you can see the extent of Sadler's total merger with the Parasite. There is no distinction between his body and the Parasite's body. They are one, which brings me to another discussion point. I've seen some people say that Sadler in this new remake story is not in control of his actions, that he is being controlled by the Plaga all along, that the true villain is the Parasite itself, and the Parasite is simply using him to spread itself across the world. While this idea does tickle my cosmic 
cosmic horror fancy because they thought that no human is in control at all here, but instead all of humanity is being manipulated and controlled by a millennia old inhuman parasite of unknown origins is definitely pretty horrific. However, I don't think this theory is really borne out by textual evidence. Just look at Sadler's visual design. There is no separation between him and the parasite. They are a single being. The parasite can't manipulate or control him in the traditional sense, because he is the parasite. He already wants whatever the parasite wants, because the parasite is him. For me, this spoils the theory that Sandler is not really in control here. I think Sandler is an excellent action game villain, not because he's a particularly complicated or emotionally dynamic character, but because his schemes are truly grand in scope, because his power is frightening, because his motivation are tinged with just enough genuine religious fanaticism to be a little more than a simple quest for personal power. I've seen people describe Resident Evil 4's story as lovable camp, a deliberately kind of goofy B-movie vibe, and in that kind of story, a villain whose plans are as ludicrous and grand as Sadler's fits into the story perfectly. 